Welcome back to ECE 501B. A week from today is exam number two. And before that, you actually have two homework assignments, one due Friday. And this is homecoming week, which means that I kind of have a lot of things going on in addition to teaching. <laughs> which is, I guess, usual, but it's more so during this week. So I will not be available during office hours on Friday. I will be available tomorrow in office hours, 9.30, I believe. I'm sorry, 10.30 to 11.30, I think, are my office hours on Thursday. I just have to wake up and look at the calendar. I don't know what my schedule is. Exam 2, though, is a week from today. And there should be material on D2L to work through if you want practice. The project is up and there's th there are three deliverables for project for the project in this class. The first deliverable is really tell me what you're planning to do. And that's due on the 21st of November, which is kind of late in the game. Hopefully I won't be needing to correct too much if correcting at all on your plan and then the main thrust of your project is deliverable number two deliverable number three is really just a reflective paragraph tell me what you learned liked didn't care so much for relative to the project that's number deliverable number three and that can actually be appended on the back of your main project report which is deliverable number two. We want to continue with chapter seven and chapter seven I hate to say this prior to Wednesday but this material won't be on exam number two so and I think I actually posted last lecture material beyond exam number two so everything we've done this week is exterior or beyond exam number two. This material will be on the final exam. And I don't know. You'll have to look at the, the question was or the comment was I think minimization is on the exam so pay, play, pay close attention to practice material as far as the topic content so that I'll probably look at what I've asked in the past on exam two and be consistent with that. What I want to do then relative to chapter seven is recap what where we started and actually linear functionals I think is in chapter six and linear functionals are just that. They're a linear map, a particular kind of linear map that maps from our vector space to the scalars. And all I'm doing here is just reminding us of what linear means. It means we can do a linear combination of the vectors or we have additivity and homogeneity. And we also know that we can find in this inner product a vector w such that if you give me a u I can give you this inner product and not, I can generate the same scalar that you generate from your linear functional. We'll talk about the adjoint today and with an example to try to get a feel for what this adjoint operator looks like. Uh, one way to sort of keep it in your head might be to say what happens if I actually wanted to slide this linear operation to the other slot. That's what then allows you to talk about the adjoint or if you now have a linear operator in the first slot what happens in the second slot for a linear operator produ to produce the same scalar. That's the adjoint operation. We'll show then that that adjoint map is linear and we will start connecting range space and null space in the two different with the two different maps with T and its adjoint and there's a relationship or there's a connection with the range space and the null space of these maps 
and it will rely on orthogonal complements or perps and that's we'll get into that then we'll talk about matrix representations if you now said oh here's a matrix representation of the linear map t as long as we're dealing with our basis vectors being orthonormal then you can actually say oh I can give you the matrix representation of the adjoint of that linear map and it's just the conjugate transpose of the original matrix associated with the linear map T. So there's an, an, a nice connection but that hinges with respect to these matrix operations or these matrix representations that depends on the basis being orth orthonormal. And then we'll talk about maps being self-adjoint, which really says that the linear map T is equal to the, the adjoint of that linear map. And what does that mean? Linear functional. Again, it's from a vector space V into the scalars. We have additivity and homogeneity, and you could write it many different ways, but you could think of it also as having this phi that maps from a vector space into scalars. And we also know or have access now to this representation theorem, Reese's representation theorem, which says given a linear functional phi, then you can find a unique vector u in the original vector space v such that if you form the inner product using that unique vector u with any vector v in your original vector space you will produce the same scalar as the linear functional produced and we know how to generate that unique vector u we start with a normal, no, an orthonormal basis for the vector space V. Then we apply that linear functional to each of those basis vectors, and that will give us a scalar. We conjugate that scalar, and we use that to scale each of the orthonormal basis vectors. And that's our U. That's our vector U. the adjoint. If you have a linear map T, and now this is not yet an operator, this is from one generic vector space V to another vector space W, this linear map T, it's not back to itself which makes it a operator, it's not two scalars specifically although W could be V or it could be F but in we're talking general now if we have a linear map T then the adjoint of that linear map we will call T dagger and T dagger is defined to be such that if we form the inner product of T V and W that will produce the same scalar as the inner product of V with T dagger W. It may not be obvious from this, but these are actually two different inner product inner products. Look at the one on the left. What are the where are the vectors? Where do the vectors live with the inner product on the left hand side of that equals sign? They are in W, aren't they? Because we have W in the second slot and TV is producing something in the codomain which is in W. So now we have vectors in W in the inner product. On the right hand side, now where are those? Those are in V. T dagger maps from the, codo the original codomain into the domain. So T dagger maps from W to V. And the inner product then on the right is using vectors in capital V. But dagger now, so what have we done? 
here's what I was meaning before. The idea behind this adjoint is that now if we didn't like that linear map in the first slot and somebody said I'd really like to have what's going on with the mapping in the second slot, oh, and then, then you want T dagger. So T dagger or the adjoint is really this linear map that allows you to slide that map from the first slot to the second slot. That's the sort of the idea behind the adjoint. It allows you to think about, oh, I want all of this messy transformation or this mapping in the second slot and not in the first slot for whatever reason. But we will now start looking at what that might look like. So let's go through an example of creating or building an adjoint. So suppose that we have, whoa, not going to go with green. I used to write all of my lectures in green and then I had a student come up and say, you know what, I can't really see very well that green color. So if you do have issues with colors that I'm using, please let me know and I'll try to change. So I, I tried to switch to a blue and a black and that's I think a little bit more, what do I want to say, visible maybe to most people. So I know that green and red can get confused if you're colorblind. So those are kind of off-limit colors sometimes as well. So I just had this semester a student write his entire exam in red ink. And I thought, what's up with this? And he apologized when he got it back. He goes, oh, I didn't realize I would wrote my exam in red ink. He didn't know. He couldn't see that it was in red ink. He thought I'd pulled out a different writing instrument. I said, oh, then apology accepted. Now I'm not so upset, although I was when I was grading it because I had to switch my pen to a different color. Actually, I was correcting it with another red ink and I thought, mm, that's not going to look very, it's not that distinctive, my red ink from the other red ink. I don't know where that came from, but anyway. We want to now go from one slot to the other. Not red ink, green. Oh, it was because I was trying to change my ink color, did I? Who knows? I got so distracted by colors. Let's, let's build an adjoint, okay? So suppose we start with a T, a linear map, that goes from R3 to R2. Just as a refresher, does anyone remember what we called such a map? <laughs> We've called it a lot of things, haven't we? I was thinking dimension changing. So we're changing from an R3 to an R2. Okay? We don't know if it's surjective. We don't know if it's injective, do we, yet? It depends on the map, and I'm not worrying about that right now. But now I'm just worrying that it's maybe not square. So it's not an operator, T. Let's now say with T of X1, X2, and X3. And now those are components. Those are not vectors. That's a vector, X1, X2, X3, with the components X1, X2, X3. And suppose that now maps into R2 being X sub 2 plus... 3x sub 3, that's in the first component, and the second component is 2x1. Let's just assume that that's our linear map. We're changing dimensions from R3 to R2. And now we want to build a T dagger. Give me the exponents. What's T dagger? What's it operating on? What's its domain and what's its codomain? It's now going from R2 to R3. So it's dimension changing, but it's going in the other direction. It now needs to go from R2 to R3. So now to create T dagger, let's 
let's just go ahead and pick a, un, a yet to be specified vector in its domain. So let's pick a w in, w, in capital W, a little w in capital W. And here I'll, I'm really, you thought I was going off the deep end with my color illustration. Look at this. So let w equal y sub 1 comma y sub 2. Don't ask me why I didn't stick with w1 and w2, but anyway. y1 is the first coordinate of w, and y sub 2 is the second coordinate of w. It's the afternoon. I just want to make sure you're awake and that you are following what's going on. So here, this is at least I'm starting in the right location. I'm starting in R2. So now that I have that W, I can say, oh, I have V, and that is going to be inner product with T dagger W. And what's the definition of the adjoint, tell me? What is that equal to? So that means that by the definition of the adjoint, that must be the same or equal to the linear map T applied to V inner product with W. And we know what TV is. We get, we were get, I gave you that. So let's put that in. We now have an X1, an X2, and an X3. Or let me just rewrite this as far as what we're saying. Here's V, and here is now T dagger W, which is Y1, Y2. And this was the W. That's the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is now T operating on the R3 vector, producing the R2 vector W. So all I'm doing right now is just rewriting or expanding using the notation that I've said I was going to use. The black line is now equivalent to the blue equality. Haven't done anything yet. Is that clear? So now I've just used the definition of the adjoint. But now the, right, the most recent right-hand side that I wrote down, we know what that TV looks like. We defined that or we agreed that that was now going to produce a 2 vector which was x sub 2 plus 3 x sub 3 and 2 x sub 1. That's simply using what we defined T to be. TV produced this two vector as an output. Well, let's now, we know how to form this inner product. First coordinate times the first coordinate in the second slot, second coordinate in the first slot times the second coordinate in the second slot. Okay, so whatever I just said, x sub 2 plus 3x sub 3 times y1 plus 2x1 times y2. And if I distribute the first one, I have x sub 2 y1 plus 3x sub 3 y1 plus 2x1 y2. Haven't done anything miraculous really at all. Yes? Yes, so the question or the yeah, the question was, I'm defining my inner product to be the Euclidean inner product, and yes, I am. So now the question was, if I give you a inner product without specifying anything, and maybe our vectors are in R, R to the N, can we assume the Euclidean? I would just, if you are thinking about it, I would just say assuming Euclidean inner product. 
But yes, that's, that's what I'm assuming here in R, R3 and R2. So where am I? Now I want to try to chase that back and slide the linear operation into the second slot. Or I could say that now I want to make this equal to x1, x2, x3 in the first slot inner product with t dagger times what's in the second I'm sorry t dagger applied to w which I was representing as y sub 1 y sub 2 so that means that I'm really wanting to see oh is there anything in this black row that scales or is being multiplied by x1 and there is and it's 2 y sub 2 what's scaling x sub 2 that's just y1 and what's scaling x sub 3 3 y sub 1 so this now tells me really how to pull or what the three vector is in the second slot of t dagger y1 y2 t dagger y1 y2 is supposed to be mapping to r3 and now i've sort of tried to write this in a way that will illustrate what needs to be in those coordinates of r3 or this is now x1 x2 x3 inner product with 2y2 in the first coordinate, y1 in the second coordinate, and 3y1 in the third coordinate. Where this is really just t dagger y1, y2. And that's now how you can define the linear map of t dagger. t dagger y1, y2 is now going to give me a 3 vector 2y2, y1, 3y1. And that's now how we would, if somebody gave you the original linear map t and they said, oh, give me t dagger, now you would hand them this linear map you give me a two vector I'll tell you how to map it to a three vector and this is the connection to make that so what are some of the properties of the adjoint operator first is T dagger a linear map And if it is a t linear map, what would we need to show? Or what do we need to show to convince us that it is a linear map? Additivity and homogeneity. So now we're looking for additivity. And homogeneity. So if we wanted to look for additivity, we could now say, oh, here is TV inner product with the sum of W1 plus W2. But we can now push this into two inner products using the additivity of the second slot or we can now write this as TV W1 plus TV inner product with W2. Now we know how to apply the adjoint definition. We didn't really know yet with that crazy stuff going on in the second slot of the, of the first inner product, but now we do. 
Now, it, by the definition of the adjoint, what's the first inner product equal to on the right-hand side of that equality? We just slide T through to the other slot, or now we have V, T dagger, W1, and the second inner product is now V with T dagger, W2. And again, we can apply properties of the inner product because we know what they, that we have additivity of the in the second slot. So that now we can write that as V inner product with T dagger W1 plus T dagger W2. But what do we know that this left hand side that we started with must be equal to by definition of the adjoint? If we just said, oh, W1 plus W2, oh, that's too scary. Just call it a W3 then what would we write for the inner product based on the definition of the adjoint? So here I'm saying, but the left-hand side is equal to well, if we just use the definition, that must be T dagger applied to W1 plus W2. But now that's equal to, well, we now know that the left-hand side is equal to this, so now what does that tell us we can say about T dagger. Well, now let's just say that the second slots have to be equal. So now we can say that T dagger W1 plus W2 is equal to T dagger W1 plus T dagger W2. That's by comparing the second slots of this, of that, with that. And that's what we needed to show. There's additivity of the adjoint operation. What about homogeneity? We can do it in a similar way. Suppose we now look at the inner product of TV with AW. What happens if we slide that scalar outside the inner product? That now conjugates it, doesn't it, because of the conjugate homogeneity property of the second slot. Or we now have A star TV with W. And now we can use our knowledge of the adjoint. We can push that T to the second slot, or we now have A star V T dagger W. But now we can slide that scalar back into the second slot by scaling the second slot by the conjugate of that scalar. Or we now can say that V, A, T dagger, W. But now what's the left-hand side equal to by definition of the adjoint? It's going to have that T dagger, A, W, right? So, but the left-hand side... is equal to, by definition of the adjoint, whatever I just said, V T dagger 
AW. And now if we compare the, left, the second slots between these two, we have what we want. We now can say, oh, so T dagger AW is equal to A T dagger W. And that's the homogeneity that we were looking for. of the adjoint operation. Yes? So, the so now the question is what? Here we're saying that this black inner product is the same as the blue inner product. And your question is, is that, the, is that sufficient? Now we're essentially, I, I think it is. Meaning we have really V in the first slot and those two inner products are equal. So their second slots have to be equal. If the first slot is equal, now we're saying that if this is true for all V's and W's, then in my mind that's sufficient to say that we can conclude that we can set those two second slots equal to each other. Yes, the, the concern is that if we have it, it could be possible that we have two vectors that produce the same inner product, but now I'm say, suggesting that for all vectors V, then if this is true for all vectors V, then the second slots have to be equal. For particular vectors, you might be able to show that you can find an inner product with V that produces the same scalar, now I'm trying to convince you that if this is true for all V and all W, then the second slots need to be equal. That's what I'm suggesting that we agree to, and then we can say that the adjoint is a linear map, the adjoint operation. So thus, this T dagger is a linear map and in general if T is a linear map from V to W then its adjoint T dagger is a linear map from W back to V. We've seen, I hope, that it's now a linear map. It also has some other properties that we can show, which we won't do. You can see those in the book, but let me just state those. The adjoint has the following properties. And if you're interested, this is 7.6 in the textbook. These properties are listed in that location. One is additivity, which says that if you have two linear maps and you add them together and then you find their adjoint, that's the same as adding the ad adjoints of the two maps, S and T. And this is true for all S and T. Obviously S and T have to be compatible linear maps to begin with. You have to be able to add them up. So S and T both need to be linear maps from V to W.
We also have a property that we could call conjugate homogeneity, which now says that if we look at scaling a linear map T and then finding its adjoint, that would be the same as scaling the adjoint by the conjugate of that scalar. So that's true for all A in our scalar field and T belonging to our linear map from V to W. So if you ever scale a linear map and then find its adjoint, then if you want to just work with the adjoint, you'd need to scale it by the conjugate of that scalar that you had originally. Another property is the adjoint of an adjoint. And I guess an uh, sorry, I shouldn't be, I don't know. I think I moved north or something. I was saying we don't want to do joints of joints. <laughs> sorry, that, that would have taken us to Canada, but uh, sorry. Current event maybe, but we're doing adjoints of adjoints, okay? I need, okay, we're almost finished with Wednesday. So here I want to now say that we have, and then you can worry about adjoints when you get home, okay? Whether you include the ad or not. No, I, never mind. So <laughs> now we have the adjoint of an adjoint. What do you think that is? Who knows now what you're seeing? we get the linear, the original linear map back. And this is true for all T in the linear map from V to W. So if you take the adjoint of an adjoint, you're back to the original linear map. What about the identity? If I now took the adjoint of the identity map, what's that going to give me? That's going to give me the identity. And one more, dealing with products. If we now looked at the product of two maps, S and T, and found their adjoint, then that's the same as taking the product of the adjoint of T after you've mapped through the adjoint of S. And that's for all T. And now you have to get a little bit more careful with where these maps are going and coming. But this now, let's say T, is starting with its domain V and maps to W then S needs to start where? It now needs to start with its domain in W and it now goes to somewhere other, some other vector space, let's say U. And I'll refer you to the book for those proofs, but it's really just playing on the properties of inner products to go through and show those properties are true. Now, let's look at some other interesting relationships between these linear maps of linear map of T and its adjoint. There is an interesting I guess it depends on how many adjoints you've gone through, whether or not you consider this interesting or useful. Sorry. There is an interesting or useful relationship between the null
or range of the linear map T and its adjoint. And this is Proposition 7 in Chapter 7, and the label on this is the null space and range of T dagger. If we start with a linear map T, let's say that's going from V to W, then we can make the following connections. First, or I. If we look at the null space of T dagger, that's actually equal to the orthogonal complement of the range space of T. So it's range T perp. And we'll show this, but now if you needed to make some connections with the range space of T or the null space of T dagger, here's one such connection that the null space of T dagger is orthogonal to the range space of T. So if you had a vector in the range space of T and you had a vector in the null space of T dagger, they're orthogonal to each other, is another way of thinking of that. Two, we can look at now the range of T dagger and that's now the orthogonal complement of the null space of T. So don't forget the perps on the bracket. Similarly, we could look in at the null space of T, and that's now the orthogonal complement of the range space of T dagger. And finally, property four or statement four concerns the range of T or the range space of T is the ortho is equal to the orthogonal complement of the null space of T dagger. <coughs> So if you ever thought you needed to be chasing your tail or you were chasing your tail, let's see if we can make sense of all these null spaces and range spaces and orthogonal complements, etc. Let's try to show one of these and let's look at the first one. So let's now do a proof of the first one. And here, Let's start by picking a vector w in the null space of T dagger. So now we're just taking an arbitrary vector little w in the null space of T dagger or in big W. If this is true, what do we know about w and how it responds when it's operated on by T dagger. If W's in the null space of T dagger, we know exactly what's going to happen when we operate on W with T dagger. It's going to give us the zero vector. So this is now zero. That's by definition of that W. So now we can say that the zero vector is orthogonal to any vector. So let's say that, let's just write that down. But we have a special way of writing the zero vector now. We can write it as T dagger W. So this now says that V inner product with T dagger W is equal to zero for all V and V.
But what's our definition of the adjoint? Or what does that allow us to write now relative to the inner product of V and T dagger W? How can we rewrite that using the definition of the adjoint? We can now say that TV inner product with W is also equal to zero for all V in capital V. But what does that say about this vector W? That vector W now gives us an inner product result of zero when it's applied to a vector TV. And now TV for all V, that's giving us the range of T, isn't it not? And we're saying that if you give me a vector in the range of T, then this W is orthogonal to it. Or you can now say that W is in the orthogonal complement of the range of T. Because no matter what V is, that could be anything in V, when we operate on it by T, for all V, we've now filled up the range of T. And the range of T now is when its inner product with that W gives us zero, so that W now is in the range of T perp. Or it's orthogonal to the range of T. But what did we start with W? W was in the null space of T dagger. So any W in the null space of T dagger will also be in the orthogonal complement of the range of T. So now we've made that connection. We now can say, therefore, the null space of T dagger is equivalent to the range of T or its orthogonal complement. Okay, so now we've verified or proven statement number one that the range of T, I'm sorry, the null space of T dagger is the same as the orthogonal complement to the range of T. Why don't we look at three? It's very similar, so let's try it. It's now working with basically interchanging T and T dagger in the definition of one, or in property I. So now if we look at three, if you liked the way we showed one, we can do the same thing for three. We can say, well, let's pick a V that lives in the null space of T. then that means that TV is equal to zero, and we can start now saying, oh, the zero vector is orthogonal to every vector, and we know how to rewrite the zero vector in a special way. We can now write that in terms of V, as the first slot is now TV, which is really the zero vector, and that's true for all W and big W. And again, our little strategy is to now say, oh, I know how to slide that linear map into the second slot by using the definition of the adjoint. And that now allows me to say, oh, V inner product with T dagger W is zero for all W in capital W. And what does that say? That says that V is orthogonal to the range space of T perp. I'm sorry, T dagger. Getting my perps and daggers mixed up. So now V 
is orthogonal to the range of T dagger, or it's in the orthogonal complement of the range of T dagger. That V is the same as this V, so it must also be in the null space of T. So the null space of T is the same as the orthogonal complement of the range of T dagger. And now we've shown property three. But if you look at those four properties and you start taking the orthogonal complements of both sides of what we've already shown, you'll get the other two. So looking at the orthogonal complements of both sides preserves that equality and so we've really shown how to arrive at all four. So taking orthogonal complements of both sides of those remaining entries allows us really to say that we're finished with proving all four statements. Now let's look at matrix representations of some of these linear maps and their adjoint. So there is a useful relationship between the matrix representation of a map and the matrix representation of its adjoint. And this is proposition 10 in chapter 7. If this list of vectors A is an orthonormal basis, on let's say this vector space V, and B is an orthonormal basis, on W then the matrix representation of the adjoint of T with basis vector B and A using W and V as those vector spaces is the conjugate transpose of the matrix representation of the original linear map T on a, an orthonormal basis A on V and an orthonormal basis B on W. I'll let you look at the book for that proof, but let's just look or remind ourselves of what we're dealing with or what 
could be happening with some examples. First, let's make sure we're all remembering what we mean by the conjugate transpose of a matrix. If I now give you the first few letters in the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, or a 2 by 3 matrix where A, B, C, D, and E, and F could be complex scalars, the conjugate transpose of that matrix is going to be what? Exactly. Did everybody catch that? If you're playing along at home, you need to be writing on the, in the air and say, oh, I have an A star, a B star, a C star, and then I transpose all of that, right? So now I take A and conjugate it, B and conjugate it, C, D, E, and F, and you know how much I love these stars, and then transpose it. Or that's then another way of writing A, B, C, D, E, F, with those entries start. So you give me a 2 by 3 with 6 elements or entries, then I'll give you a 3 by 2 with those corresponding entries transposed and conjugated. So you could then think of the transpose of the matrix representation of T and then take complex conjugate or you could do it the other way. You could take the complex conjugate which is what I did and then transpose that result. So let's look at some examples of this. If you're going to be talking about adjoints when you go home, you want to be able to get, provide them an example, right? Oh, here's a T. Here's its adjoint. So let's say that we now have T that's a linear map from C3 to C3. So what is T actually if we wanted to be a little bit more specific than just saying it's a linear map? It's an operator now, isn't it? And I'm going to assume that we're using the standard orthonormal basis vectors. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Those are my basis vectors for V and W. And V and W are the same. Let me just say that now T, X, Y, Z, that linear map, I'm going to say, will produce the following vector. 2X plus 1 minus I, Y in the first coordinate. The second coordinate is 3 plus 2I, x minus 4iz and then the third coordinate is 2ix plus 4 minus 3iy minus 3z and our eventual goal is to find the adjoint of T. But now we have another way of doing that because now we can use Proposition 17. I'm sorry, 710. If we're dealing with orthonormal basis vectors on the input or on the domain and codomain. Input vector space and output vector space and that's what I've assumed. So now, really if we can find 
matrix representations of one of those, we can find the matrix representation of the other by the conjugate transpose, and then we can pull out the linear map from that matrix representation. What's the matrix representation of this linear map? What does that look like? Here's one approach for a solution. If I now say, oh, the matrix representation of T, boy, I've just about had my fill of adjoints, haven't I? What is this? How big is that matrix representation? How big, what are the dimensions on A? It's square, isn't it? It's three by three. And I now want to put something in that three by three matrix such that when I operate on X, Y, Z, I end up in my first coordinate or first component of my output vector giving me two X plus one minus I, Y and my input vector is x, y, z. So that now, what should go in the first, in the 1, 1 entry of this A matrix? Just 2. What about in the, based on the first coordinate of my output, where am I at now? Am I in the row or the first column of A? I'm in the first row and I don't need to pick up a Z or I don't need to scale Z. So Z, that 1, 3 entry is 0 and my 1, 2 entry is that scalar 1 minus I. Does everybody see that? So I've now completed the top row. And if I do the same thing for the second coordinate of my output, now I'm playing in the second row of my A matrix. The first entry in that second row is 3 plus 2i. The middle entry is 0, and the third entry is minus 4i. So I have 3 plus 2i, 0, and minus 4i, and finally, I have the full bottom row having non-zero elements. First, or the 3, 1 entry is 2i. The 3, 2 entry is 4 minus 3i. And the 3, 3 entry is minus 3. Well, now if I have this matrix representation of the linear map T, I now simply need to, f I can now write down the matrix representation of the adjoint of T. That's just the conjugate transpose of this matrix. So now the matrix representation of T dagger is now simply the conjugate transpose of A which is 2, 0, minus 3. I'll do the hard part. If those weren't real, I would have had to conjugate the diagonals, even though I don't have to move them if I'm transposing. But now in the 2, 1 entry, that's now 1 plus i. In the 1, 2 entry, 3 minus 2i, and now my 1, 3 entry is minus 2i. What about my 2, 3 entry? In A star transpose. That's now 4 plus 3i. This one should be 4i, and this one's 0. 
Is it okay what I've done? Have I stayed awake enough to write down the, right, the correct answer? That's now the conjugate transpose of A, and now I just need to put that into a linear map because that will be then T dagger. Let's say it also is going to be operating on a three vector X, Y, Z so that now what am I going to see in the first coordinate of the output vector? Is that okay? That's easier than the other, wasn't it? The reverse is finding, finding the matrix representation of T is maybe a little bit more difficult than doing the linear map now to find T dagger. The second coordinate is now 1 plus I X plus 4 plus 3 I Z. That's the second coordinate. And finally the third coordinate is 4 I Y minus 3 Z. That's now the adjoint of my original linear map T. One more. Since we're having so much fun with all this mapping. Let's look at adjoint example two. And here, let's now suppose that we start with a linear map that goes from R3 to R3. Or, or and now let's say that TXY is going to be 2x plus y, 3x, and 4y minus 3z. Now you can just roll through the punches, right? What's the matrix representation of that linear map T? top row is 2, 1, 0. The second row is 3. And, I'm sorry, 3, 0, 0. And the third row is 0, 4, minus 3. Now we want to find the complex conjugate transpose of that matrix representation which will give us the matrix representation of T dagger. Now we don't even really need to worry about the conjugate part of this. We just need to transpose that matrix. So that now we have 2, 3, 0, 1, 0, 4, and 0, 0, minus 3. So that we can write down T dagger of X, Y, Z as a linear map. And it becomes 2X plus 3Y, X plus 4Z, and minus 3z. What if we wanted to actually check our work? What do I mean? Well, let's just, since we're having so much fun with this matrix vector stuff why, and inner products, let's just do one example. Or really see if we can find out if these two inner products are the same. If TVW is the same as V 
inner product with T dagger W. Is that true? Now, is this a proof? No, we're just kind of doing a, a gut check. Is this going to give us, at least for some generic vectors, the, a consistent answer? Then, okay, maybe we're on to something here. But really, I'm just letting us see what happens when we start doing all of these matrix, linear map examples with inner products. So suppose that now T is a linear map from V to W, and let's now let V be one zero, whoops, let's make it a little more interesting than that, one one zero, and W, let's let it be zero one one. Or now we want to look at TVW, or the inner product of TV and W, which means that we need to first find TV. And T was 210300004 minus 3. And V was. 110, and now do you see how quickly you can compute that? That's just the sum of the first two columns of T as a linear map. So now we have 3, 3, 4 for the vector TV. But if we want TVW, now we're forming the inner product the Euclidean inner product of 3, 3, 4 with W, which was 1, 1, or I'm sorry, 0, 1, 1, and that's going to be 7. Just 3 plus 4. What if we looked at the other case, which is now V inner product with T dagger W? Hopefully that's equal to 7. If it's not, then we know we've messed up. So T dagger W, we have T dagger, that was 2, 3, 0, 1, 0, 4, and 0, 0, minus 3. W was 0, 1, 1. And now we're combining the second, or the last two columns, adding those. We have 3, 4, minus 3. And that doesn't look at all like what TV looked like. T dagger W is different, but we now want to form the inner product of V with T dagger W, or this is now 1, 1, 0, inner product with 3, 4, minus 3. Yay! And we get 7. So there we simply worked through just to kind of do a check on our thought process and convince ourselves maybe that this isn't all just a bunch of hooey. That maybe it does mean something. What do we want to start on next time? Well, we want to look at self-adjoint operators. And what does that mean? Well, that means if I, now you know what T dagger and T look like. Were they the same in this example? Was T equal to, the matrix representations anyway, was T equal to T dagger? No. I want to give you one more word so you can go home and kind of throw it around. You already know adjoint. <laughs> Maybe you don't want to push that too hard, but here, <clears throat> let's say an operator T, and now we know what that looks like. That's now an element of script L of V is self-adjoint 
like I said, maybe you don't want to be using that adjoint, so here's another word. Also called Hermitian. Hermitian, if you heard that. So if somebody now talks about a Hermitian operator, you now know another way of referring to that. This Hermitian operator is, or an operator T is Hermitian if T is equal to its adjoint. Or you could say it's self-adjoint. Either way, we know that they're the same. So we'll pick up with these Hermitian operators or self-adjoint operators the next time we meet.